Hello everyone and welcome to the second part of the evolution of European traveling coasters. In this part I will tell you about the traveling coasters between 1978 and present. If you want to learn more about traveling coasters before 1978, you can watch part 1. You can click on the link in the description below or you can click in the eye on the top right corner of your screen. Let's get started. And now 1978. This was a very important year for traveling coasters. In that year, the first two inverting traveling coasters were sold to German showman Oskar Brug and Fritz Kinsler. They traveled with the Super Spirale and the Looping Star. The Looping Star was made by Schwarzkopf and once again designed by Werner Stengel. This was Schwarzkopf's first coaster that used the cone plug system. The cone plug system doesn't only allow for easy assembly and disassembly of the track, but also a butter smooth ride experience. It debuted in 1978 and it was advertised as the absolute top attraction from the USA, probably referring to the success of Magic Mountain's revolution. And then the Super Spirale was Vekoma's very first coaster. The model was named MK12000 Corkscrew with Byron Curve. The Super Spirale featured a 20 meter or 65 feet tall drop and two corkscrews. It was sold to Brug and Kinsler in 1978, but they only took it out to one fair in August 1979. It operated at the Anna Kiemes in Duren and was then sold to Traumland Park, currently known as Movie Park Germany. Unlike the Super Spirale, the Looping Star was a very great success. German showman Rudolf Bath, who already traveled with the Wildcat and then upgraded to a Jetstar 2, also wanted to upgrade to a coaster with inversions, but something better than Brug's looping star. In 1979, Bath bought the Doppel looping. As the name suggests, the coaster features two vertical loops. Just like the looping star, it has a compact layout with a slightly bigger footprint than the looping star. This was the start of the German coaster war. To compete with but Doppelupping, Brug bought the Colossus, working together with another German showman, Robra. The Colossus was identical to Bart's Doppelupping, but it had an extended helix at the end. They didn't travel with the Colossus for a long time. After the 1982 season, they sold it to Lagoon in the US, where it still operates to this day as Colossus the Fire Dragon. As a replacement for the Colossus, Brug bought the Himalaya Bahn. In 1983. This coaster is taller and has a bigger footprint than the Colossus, but it doesn't feature any inversions. This is a very loved coaster among all ages and it's still traveling with Brug to this day under the name of Alpina Bahn. And also in 1983, Schwarzkopf went bankrupt for the first time due to multiple problems. After his first bankruptcy, Schwarzkopf stopped producing all models and only produced custom coasters. So this meant the end for the well-known models like the Looping Star, Doppellooping, Alpenblitz 2, etc, etc. So Bath wanted something a lot more spectacular than Brug's Alpina Bahn, but with the same footprint. So in 1984, Bath introduced the Dreie Looping. Just like Bath and Brug's previous coasters, the Dreie Looping was manufactured by Schwarzkopf and designed by Werner Stengel. Dreie Looping featured three vertical loops and was a very great success. Brug couldn't compete to the Dreie Looping with the Himalaya Bahn, so they bought another coaster named Thriller. Thriller featured four vertical loops, and unlike Schwarzkopf's previous transportable looping coasters, Thriller's loops used the normal cone plug track and the loops were very wide. While Thriller was produced, Schwarzkopf went bankrupt for the second time. Thriller's track was then finished by BHS, a Bavarian steel mining company, who has helped Schwarzkopf before. Brug then traveled with both the Himalaya Bahn and Thriller, so at some big fairs they put both coasters next to each other. Bath once again wanted to beat Brug, so in 1989 he bought Olympia Looping. 
Unlike any other coaster in the world, this coaster has 5 vertical loops and a very compact layout. This coaster was once again designed by Werner Stengel and produced by BHS using Schwarzkopf's track styles. Olympia looping pretty much meant the end for the German coaster war. While the war was going on between Brug and Bath, some other major traveling coasters were produced by Schwarzkopf and some other companies. In 1979, Schwarzkopf introduced the Silbub file, which was a smaller and more compact version of the looping style. And in 1980, Schwarzkopf introduced the Catapult. Their goal was to make the smallest inverting traveling coaster. The coaster was powered by booster wheels and could go through the loop both backwards and forwards. Five catapults were built, four of them for German showmen and one of them for a French showman. And in 1982, Schwarzkopf introduced the Münchner Bahn. This coaster's footprint is a little bit smaller than Himalaya Bahn's footprint and it's almost as tall as Himalaya Bahn. The first and only Münchner Bahn was sold to German showman Pöch and traveled in Germany until 1984. This coaster featured two tunnels and a station at a height of about 10 meters or 30 feet. The station was accessible by stairs. Two other Münchner Bahns were planned to be built, but sadly that never happened. And in 1983, Schwarzkopf introduced the Jumbo V. This was the fifth and last model of the Jetstar line. The Jumbo V has a slightly smaller footprint than the Jetstar 1, and it's a little bit less tall, and the track length is about the same. Unlike any other of the Jetstars, the Jumbo V uses a tire wheel lift, and only one Jumbo V was built. It was sold to German showman Kinsler. Eventually, the Jumbo V ended up at Pleasurewood Hills in the UK as Cannonball Express, and it still operates to this day. And in the late 80s, Schwarzkopf's portable shuttle loop made it out to Germany and traveled with German showman Gutzke from 1988 till 1989. And French manufacturer Soquet also wanted to join in on the inverting traveling coaster game, so in 1983 they built the Colossus for French showman Van Crainest. Colossus had two loops which used a track style very similar to Schwarzkopf box type track style. And in the mid 80s, Pinfari introduced their looping Zyklon. It was available in various sizes, but only the smallest one became really popular the CL42. This one ended up getting produced more than 40 times. And in 1986, Zero introduced the Helldiver. The Helldiver was a large transportable indoor coaster. Only one Helldiver was built and it was called Black Hole. It traveled in Germany until 2018. And now the next era, the 90s. The 90s meant the end for two very iconic traveling coasters, the Dry Looping and the Thriller. Bart stopped traveling with the Dry Looping in 1996 and sold it to Malaysia. Eventually it ended up standing but not operating in Mexico. Bruch stopped traveling with the Thriller in 1996 and then sold it to Six Flags Astro World. After it being relocated multiple times, it's currently laying disassembled in Mexico. And in 1992, German showman Renaldi bought the Magic Mountain. It was built by German manufacturer Stein and Stengel designed it. It was advertised as the largest transportable indoor coaster. It has three trains with 11 spinning cars on each train. And in 1997, they completely rethemed the coaster, renaming it to Star World. And between 2006 and 2007, they rethemed it again to Höhlenblitz, and they modified the coaster too. For example, they extended the outdoor drop. Gerslauer was involved with the modification of this coaster. And in 1995, Brug bought their last really big coaster the Eurostar. This coaster was once again designed by Werner Steng. Because inverted coasters were very popular back then, Brug wanted to join in on the trend and he made a rough draft for a layout for an inverted coaster. 
He originally wanted BNM to make the Eurostar, but BNM was not willing to make a traveling coaster and they were already busy with other projects. So the project was a work of a lot of different manufacturers. Giovanolo fabricated the track, the lift and most of the electrical system. Intamin designed and produced the operator panel. The supports were made by a German company called Manhardt. The trains were assembled by Giovanola with components of an unknown Dutch company. The cash box area was made by Mack and the exit area was made by Gerslauer. Eurostar has four inversions, a loop, an inline twist and a double corkscrew. This coaster is said to be very forceful and it was an icon at many German fairs. And by the 90s, as good as all wooden coasters disappeared from the fair circuit due to high maintenance costs and hard assembly and disassembly. Newer coasters like Pinfari Cyclones and Schwarzkopf's transportable coasters were a lot easier to maintain, a lot more exciting and a lot cheaper. In the mid 90s, Mack reinvented the Wild Mouse. Just like the original wooden Wild Mice, the new Mack Wild Mouse features several sudden sharp turns and drops. But they are a lot easier to transport and to maintain than the original ones. These Wild Mouse coasters became so popular that some showmen bought two of them and put them next to each other at big events. Also Motor Sona made their version of the Wild Mouse. The layout is identical to Max Wild Mouse but the trains are different. The first two prototypes, which were bought by German showman Kinsler as a double unit, had one row cars. The later modern wild mice have two row cars. And in the late 80s and early 90s, Pinfari produced a model simply named Roller Coaster. It was available in four sizes, the RC40, RC48, RC50 and RC70 the numbers referring to the length of the coaster's footprint. The coaster was described as a new generation of the Cyclones, however Pinfari still produced the Cyclones back then and the roller coaster line model didn't become as popular as the Cyclones. The RC40 was the most popular model of the four. And somewhere in the late 90s, French company Riverchamp introduced the spinning wild mouse. This was the first ever modern spinning coaster. This model became extremely popular and a lot of them were produced by Riverchamp in the early 2000s. Maurer also made their version of the spinning wild mouse. This one didn't end up getting as popular as the Riverchamp spinning wild mice. But Maurer made another spinning coaster with a compact layout, which was way more exciting than their spinning wild mouse. The model was called SC2000 and several European showmen bought one of those in the early 2000s. And in 1997, French showman Van Crainest bought a big traveling coaster, once again made by Soquet. They clearly took some inspiration from the Himalaya Bahn, also known as Alpina Bahn, but the quality of the coaster is a lot worse. Van Krijnest's coaster is called King and is currently still traveling on the French fair circuit. And in 1999, Reverchon introduced a suspended wild mouse, named the Gliding Coaster. The first one of these is called Eurostar and was sold to Dutch showman Buwalda. They still travel with the Euro coaster on the Dutch and German fair circuit. Only one other gliding coaster was built by Reverchon and this one's called Ala Delta and was sold to Spanish showman Banyuls in 2000. And now on to the next era, the 2000s and later. In 2004, Pinfari went bankrupt. This meant the end for most of their original models like the Zyklon, the RC models and Wacky War, for example. Italian company Interpark acquired the brand and intellectual property of Pinfari in 2007. Together with SBF Visa and some other manufacturers, they still make wacky worms and cyclones. And later in the 2000s, traveling coasters kept on evolving. 2008 meant the end of the iconic Eurostar we talked about before. It was sold to Gorky Park in Moscow 
and it's currently still operating at Detsky Park in Russia. And basically in 2000s and after, no very big traveling coasters have been built. Smaller coasters like Wild Mice, Wacky Worms, Cyclones and stuff are still being produced by several Italian companies to this day. And in 2009, Xenox made its debut. This small coaster was built by Interpark and it was from the model Wildwind. It has a very compact layout featuring a side window and a helix. Xenox first traveled on the Swiss fair circuit with Bauer from 2009 till 2012. Then it was sold to German showman Ach, who traveled with it until the 2016 season. This was the only Interpark Wildwind to make it out to European fairs. And also in 2009, the Steiger Achterbahn company bought Laser from Dorney Park, which is the second Schwarzkopf Doppelloop. They completely refurbished it, they renamed it to Teststrecke and repainted it and gave it new trains. Teststrecke traveled on the German fair circuit until 2018, then it spent the 2019 season at Wiener Prater, and then it was sold to British showman Mellors, who took it to Saudi Arabia. And in 2016, Drifting Coaster was introduced by Reversion. This coaster features several flat turns that make the free swinging gondolas swing. Only one Drifting Coaster has been built, and it was sold to German showman Arendt. And in 2018, Reversion announced a second generation of the spinning wild mouse. Already two of them have been produced, and one of them is currently traveling in Germany. And as a conclusion, in 2020, not a lot of good traveling coasters are left. Coasters that have been traveling for a very long time in Germany, like Black Hole and Hullenblitz, ended up at parks, and some coasters like Teststrecke ended up in the Middle East. Luckily, not all classic traveling coasters are gone. German showman Vorlop still owns two Schwarzkopf Jetstars and a Zierer Flitzer. Those are the only two Schwarzkopf Wildcats that are still traveling and the only Flitzer is still traveling. And in France, the first ever Schwarzkopf Jetstar from 1969 is still traveling. And of course, Olympia Looping and Alpinaban are still traveling. And I really, really hope all the coasters I just mentioned continue traveling as long as possible. Because I've, I've been on Alpinaban and Olympia Looping and they are so good. They are really beautiful to look at. And and if, if like Olympia Looping or Alpinaban would get sold to something very far away, that would be the end of an era. The era of good traveling coasters. Thank you all for watching. I hope you learned something. And again, if you want to see a video similar to this but about the North American traveling coasters, you can go to Phantom Coasters channel to watch it. Thank you all for watching and I will see you guys next time. Goodbye.